Okay, so hopefully you enjoyed watching the piece on flirting during ovulation, um, the piece on copulins, and the piece on the role of testosterone in sexual attractiveness. Uh, what I wanted you to get from all of those pieces is the idea that females might be more receptive, more sexually um, interested, um, more likely to cheat was one of the issues that they raised um, during ovulation, and that males are more attracted to the smell of copulins. Um, so the idea that um, that other people around them are having engaging in sexual activity, and so copulins might be being released, might make uh, a female that's nearby seem more attractive than she would would have seemed before. A lot of these explanations are really relying on sort of this human sexual, I mean, sorry, this um, evolutionary psychology interpretation of sexual attractiveness. Um, and we're going to talk about that more as the quarter goes on. Okay, so I wanted to transition over from, um, you know, these biological estrus kinds of things and into more of an understanding of human sexual responding. Um, so we can thank Masters and Johnson for most of the things that we know about um, sexual responding, um, thanks to their clinical observational strategies, where they observed over 10,000 complete sexual response cycles um, among their volunteers. And so a lot of people have criticized their work on the basis of who the volunteers were. I talked a little bit about that when we were talking about recruitment of participants and stuff, that, you know, the fact that it's kind of, you know, volunteer bias. It's kind of hard to get people to come into the lab and let us observe them while they masturbate, right? Like this is a difficult sell for most people. And so some people have complained that the results might not be um, representative of the average person, um, things like that. I always like to fall back on the, uh, it's the best that we've got. You know what I mean? Like how else are we supposed to at least get an idea of sexual responding if we say that it, you know, unless you can get everybody in the world to participate, it's just not really that meaningful. Um, so their, their results, their interpretations have been questioned, right? The, the idea is that they've, the way that they've concluded that, that sexual responding occurs, that's been questioned and that's a valid one. And we're going to see some alternative theories or, or interpretations as we go on. So there are some, there are some questions with this, but it is the granddaddy of all the human resp sexual response cycle um, theories. And so we're going to start with it. All right. So they wrote a book in 1966 called The Human Sexual Response. Catchy title. Um, in 1970, they made a catchier title called um, On Sex and Human Loving. That sounds a little bit more attractive. And then ultimately, they wrote a book called The Pleasure Bond. They were husband and wife when they were doing this research. I think she might have started out as a research assistant, but um, they did ultimately divorce in the 1990s, which was a little disappointing and kind of surprising because they were pretty they were pretty advanced in age when they got divorced. And, and I don't know about you, but my stereotype is that, man, you're on the downhill slide now. Why would you give up now? But anyway, it seems a little ironic that the Masters and Johnson sex researchers ultimately ended up divorcing. So um, anyway, so that's kind of their background and, and, um, you know, the impact that they've had on the culture. Cause you know, a lot of people read those, those later two books. Um, so let's talk about what their basic model is. All right. So first off we have, uh, four phases of human sexual responding. And so they call it the four phase model. Um, a lot of more modern researchers have shortened it to the e -poor model because you've got E, excitement, P, plateau, O, orgasm, and R, resolution. And you see very similar patterns for the male as you see for the female. If you look at just the two red, you know, the red and then the green, they look very similar for the male and the female. The female seems to have an added potential um, pattern that they did not see in any of the males. So let's break this down into its component parts. E is for excitement. Yay. All right. E is for excitement. So during this phase, um, males and females alike experience vasocongestion. What that means is that blood is going to flow to the genitals. And in the case of the male, it's going to make the penis become erect. Remember, we talked about the corpus 
spongiosum and the corpora cavernosa, and they flood with blood, and that's what causes erection. The same thing happens to the clitoris. We've talked already about how the clitoris is identical to the penis, except for that it doesn't have a urethra going through it and that it's much smaller, but it has all the same spon spongy tissue as the penis does. So during phasocongestion, um, blood goes flowing into those spongy tissues and make the penis or the clitoris erect. In addition, for the female, blood flows into the labia. And so especially the labia minora are going to start to increase in size. Inside the female, we'll also see that the um, vagina starts to expand, especially the upper one third of it, the part that's closest to the uterus, will start to expand. Lubrication will be secreted from the walls of the vagina. Back in the olden days, before Masters and Johnson did their research and inserted vaginal plasmithographs into women's vaginas to detect fluids and stuff, the common assumption was that the Bartholin's glands that I talked to you guys about during the anatomy component, um, that the Bartholin's glands provided lubrication. But thanks to their research, it became abundantly clear that it's actually the v vaginal walls, the actual internal of the vagina that secretes fluid. And that's what causes uh, lubrication. On the chest, this is a picture of a female breast, but it happens on males and females alike. There is a, an, a, fl a flood of blood to the nipples, the areola, um, the breast tissues in general. So you start to see more um, superficial veins in, you know, you get swelling in the chest area. Everything becomes more sensitive in the chest area. We call that sex flush as the blood, the blood goes flooding into the chest. Um, it becomes red, it becomes flushed. And so that's called sex flush, creative. All right, so that was excitement. Now P is for plateau. So um, during the plateau phase, you're fully excited, like all the vasocongestion has occurred. And so the penis is as erect as the penis can become and the corona and the glands of the penis become very erect, like previously, there might have been rigidity of the shaft, but the glands and the corona are completely engorged with blood and they may actually cause the glands to look like purpley red and um, the ability of the erection to get lost it's it's pretty unlikely at this point once we're at the plateau phase the erection is is going to stay until orgasm the scrotum has pulled the testicle up closer to the body and so the, the skin of the scrotum is a lot thicker and the testicles are way higher. Uh, man, I forgot to ask you guys to try and think of the times when the scrotum pulls up closer to the body. One of them is sexual excitement. One of them is cold, right? Like most people know that when you're cold enough, your scrotum will pull the testicles up and might even push the testicles like partly back into the body through the, you know, the canal that they had come out of. But there's actually a third time that the scrotum pulls the testicles up really close. And that's when uh, there's a really fearful experience, like really scared. That'll pull the testicles up too. I forgot to mention that during anatomy. So I threw it in now. So during the plateau phase, the testicles are pulled up really tight. And uh, the cowper's gland is going to secrete its fluids that are going to lubricate the um, urethra right, to make sure that there's nothing in there that would be harmful to the sperm that's going to be passing soon. So I think I hit all the main things on that. So now if we look at the female, um, this is the point when the clitoris actually retracts under the clitoral hood. Direct stimulation might actually be perceived as um, painful or not pleasant during this phase. And so pulling back under the hood gives that sort of indirect pressure on the clitoris. Um, the clitoris is just like the penis, as erect as it's going to get, right? It's full of blood. The glands is full of blood. The labia minora are so full of blood that they actually will change in color. And then this is the point when the Bartholin's glands are going to secrete fluid. Um, and so there are these little openings inside the labia minora in the vestibule of the vagina that will secrete this fluid. And anybody who's ever performed oral sex on a female might realize that there was a moment when the secretions tasted different 
And that's the Bartholin's glands that are contributing that change of taste. Now, internally, I don't have a picture that depicts the, uh, the tinting very well. So I just labeled it here. But what happens in the upper one third of the vagina is that with increased excitement, the uterus is actually lifting up and pulling away from that upper one third of the vagina so that there's a bigger space up there. Um, this is actually really important to know because during arousal, um, the, the cervix might be down lower in the vagina and it might actually um, be hit by, you know, a penis or fingers that are inserted into the vagina. When a woman has entered into the plateau phase, the uh, cervix will have pulled up a lot more and it's less likely to be struck by a penis or by fingers. And so um, if there's, you know, sort of painful thrusting or something, it's time to back off and sort of work on arousal further because the person's, the woman's not actually fully aroused yet. At plateau, usually it'll get out of the way. Now, this is one of the reasons why a lot of women though say, you know, a very large penis isn't that attractive to them because, you know, having your cervix hit isn't that pleasant, especially if you have any adhesions or something like we talked about with endometriosis. Um, so jostling this, the cervix can radiate out into, um, you know, the internal organs and it's not really necessarily that pleasant. Um, and so part of the reason why women don't complain that much about, uh, you know, average to slightly below average size penis is because, you know, they don't have that problem, um, that painful problem. Um, so here we have the sex flush pretty pronounced in this drawing. Um, you know, the nipples are erect and things like that. All right. So we are in these people, we are experiencing, you know, full plateau phase arousal. The next thing that's going to occur is orgasm. Generally, when you're in the plateau phase towards the end of it, there is this sensation that orgasm is inevitable. And so uh, orgasm is our next stage. So you guys will just have to memorize that during orgasm, traditionally males will uh, ejaculate semen through their urethra. <laughs> surprising news. Um, but it is kind of surprising news because it turns out that the sensations of orgasm are in fact separate from ejaculation. And we know that from people who have uh, had multiple orgasms, males can have multiple orgasms. It's sort of a myth that only females can do that. Um, but they cannot have multiple ejaculations. And so in males who have multiple orgasms, they report the same kinds of physical sensations and contractions and feelings um, without the expulsion of semen. So it's th those two things are in fact separate from each other, but for the average male, when they reach orgasm, they ejaculate. Okay, so what happens during orgasm? Um, I said contractions happen, right? One of the main signs of, con of orgasm is contraction of the, um, the pubococcyx muscles, um, the muscles that control the urethra, the muscles around the anus, um, just basically all the pelvic floor muscles contract and they contract in a very rhythmic way. And it's the same for males as for females. Um, they contract rhythmically at a, a, a distance is the word I'm thinking of, but they are, you know, about 0.8 seconds apart and they occur somewhere between eight and 12 times. That's pretty specific. Thank you, Masters and Johnson. Um, but Males and females report virtually the exact same sensations of these contractions of their pelvic floor muscles. Um, the uh, vaginal plasmithographs and the penile strain gauges picked up the contractions and they are very consistent. The intensities are the same between male and female bodies. Um, and so very similar experiences of orgasm. Um, here's a better comparison between the male and the female picture, right? Because we see the anal sphincters contracting in the female, just like the male. The one thing that females have that's different from males is that they're, that giant muscle called the uterus is contracting. So males have contractions in the, in the vas deferens. Um, they have contractions in the prostate gland. So they have areas that are contracting that are different from what females have. And then females have the uterus contracting. And so that big muscle contributes a lot of the sensation that females have when they're reaching orgasm. Uh, the outer vagina also contracts 
in females because it's part of those pelvic floor muscles. And they're sort of analogous to see where um, the actual line on the male picture is pointing and see how there's like that line of muscles there. It's sort of in an analogous position to the opening of the, of the vagina. So very similar areas as far as muscles. Um, there are structures that are contracting that are different between the male and the female, but the sensations are very similar. All right. So I mentioned the multiple orgasms. Um, so what, what Masters and Johnson discovered is that there were, um, slightly different patterns between males and females. So males on the left, the most common pattern that Masters and Johnson saw was, you know, this starting from a resting state, they go into excitement, they reach the plateau phase, and they called it the plateau phase, because see how they sort of stay at the same level of intensity for some period of time. And then there's this burst of orgasm. And then for most of the men, they'd enter into what's called a refractory period while they go through resolution. The refractory period is a period of time where no amount of stimulation will result in another ejaculation. Like there's nothing that you can do to cause another ejaculation. Um, Things need to get back in order. Um, Everything needs to be prepared so that an ejaculation can occur again, right? Some, Some of the sperm need to move into the proper spot of the epididymis. There's a whole bunch of stuff that has to return to normal. The the prostate gland needs to, you know, absorb enough fluid to make another one. And like, it all has to get back in alignment again. So no amount of stimulation will cause another ejaculation. But they did find that for a small subset of men, you know, continuing stimulation could result in another orgasm. So um, males had that those two patterns, the most common being the one outlined in red. Now for females, the most common pattern was this um, one that was outlined in blue on the female panel. And so you see them going through excitement, entering in the plateau phase, reaching orgasm, and then um, going into resolution. But for some women, they'd have that second orgasm if they maintained stimulation. For some women though, so that's kind of like the men, right? But for some women, the yellow pattern happened where see how they're coming through the excitement phase and then kind of losing it for a second and then a little bit more excitement and then kind of losing it again. Then they get up and they're going through excitement and they never really plateau out very much. And then they have this long protracted orgasm and then they have a quick resolution. So like that, they didn't see that in men. And then the final thing that they didn't really see in men was the women that are depicted in the red line where they experience excitement, they get up to the plateau phase and they just sort of stay in the plateau phase a little bit less aroused, a little bit more aroused, a little less. They keep going back and forth, back and forth, and they never reach orgasm and then they resolve. And their resolution took the longest to sort of return back to their their heart rate, back to its normal state, their blood pressure back to its normal state and things like that. So there was more variability in what the women displayed than what the men displayed. It's basically what Masters and Johnson found. Now, something that oftentimes comes up yeah, um, is the issue of whether women can ejaculate and where is their G spot. So I thought I'd cover that. Okay, so first off, if there is a Grafenberg spot in a female who is currently listening or a partner of a female, <laughs> um, if there is a Grafenberg spot inside of her, it would be on the front part of her vagina, the part that's towards the stomach. And about one third of the way in. In women who have G spots, it tends to be this cluster of cells that's very um, consistent. Like it looks the same across all women who seem to have a a G spot. I'm being really careful because not all women seem to have G spots. So one hypothesis is that um, these are Skene's glands and that these are, uh, that they contain erectile tissue that during arousal, they these glands become rigid, right? With blood flow and stuff. Um, It's very analogous in cell structure to the prostate gland in men. So some people have called the Skene's glands the female prostate. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure and tell you guys about the differentiation that occurs prenatally is that um, during prenatal development, if a structure doesn't fully go away, doesn't degenerate, you know, as it should for that sex, 
it could stay, you know, it could, it could still be in the person and having an effect on them, right? So if this structure that becomes the prostate gland is supposed to degenerate in the absence of a Y chromosome, but it doesn't fully do it, you could be left behind with Skene's glands. So not all females are thought to have it, but a lot are thought to have it. Um, they think it's about, it's hard to tell, right? Because a lot of it has to do with self-report of sensations and things that some people might not want to talk about or, or things like that. So they think it's somewhere between a half to about two thirds of women probably have Skene's glands. So it's not um, bad, good, indifferent. It is just the case that some women seem to have it and some don't. Now, in a meta-analysis of studies that were conducted on female ejaculation, so a meta-analysis is, is where these researchers, in this case, this one individual, um, went through all the known studies on female ejaculation and looked for patterns, right, consistencies. And um, what this researcher found is that depending on the study, as few as 10% and as many as 54% of participants reported that, that they had experienced female ejaculation. Um, now, female ejaculation is when fluid comes out of the female urethra. And a lot of times the woman thinks that it's urine, but then it doesn't smell like urine. So they're like, what is that? And sometimes it can be a lot of fluid. Other times it can be just a few drops. And so it can be perplexing for the woman who's experiencing it um, or for their partner who's never seen something like that before. And so, uh, you know, researchers are interested in what might be the source, how common it is, things like that. So women have reported, um, you know, as little as, you know, a few drops to 900 milliliters. So that's almost a liter of fluid. Like that's more than the typical bladder would hold. Um, so something's going on, right? And um, in some of the studies, it was self-reports. And in some of the studies, they actually did sort of a Masters and Johnson clinical um, observation and collected the fluid that was ejaculated. And they found that the fluid contained proteins that are very similar to what the male prostate secretes. So if you recall back, I talked about how the seminal fluid that males ejaculate it, about 94% of that volume is contributed by the prostate gland. So um, there, there's a pretty decent volume that comes out of that. The typical ejaculation is about a tablespoon of fluid. That's nowhere near 900 milliliters of fluid. So it can't be that all the fluid is coming from the Skene's glands. I mean, even a full-fledged prostate doesn't secrete 900 milliliters of fluid. So there's something else going on. It's not really clear. It's very difficult to study something like this because a lot of people, unfortunately, are like embarrassed that they have this. Um, others are, um, you know, unaware that they um, are secreting any fluid. So it's very difficult to actually study this. All I can say at the conclusion of this discussion is that um, not all women have Grafenberg spots and that for some women, an attempt to find it is actually um, aversive. It doesn't feel good to them. It actually feels like you're going to make them urinate or um, there's a pressure that doesn't feel good to them. So unfortunately, ever since Grafenberg described his spot um, that he had discovered, it's become like this um, holy grail, right? Of you got to find it and it would be the greatest thing ever. And it's not necessarily the greatest thing ever for all women. So it's really important for partners to be, you know, aware of what their partner likes or doesn't like. And it's not, it shouldn't, I think a theme throughout this class is that none of, no sexual behavior should probably be goal oriented. Um, it should be about pleasure and what feels good. And, you know, so if it doesn't feel good, you back off, right? It might be actually painful. All right. Our final stage resolution. Um, so Something that I didn't really talk about as far as um, excitement very clearly was the idea that, you know, during the excitement phase, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your breathing becomes quicker and more shallow, 
right? These are all signs of like physiological arousal. So during the resolution phase, you're going to be returning everything back to normal. So you're going to, you know, the blood is going to flow out of those um, spongy tissues in the penis and in the clitoris, right? Um, for the male, like I mentioned, there's going to be this refractory period. Um, you know, the cer cervix is going to go back down to where it had been. Now, what's really interesting about female resolution phase is that during resolution, the cervix widens slightly. And one hypothesis about the function of that is that it allows for like an upsuck of sperm to help ensure fertilization. So that's kind of an interesting um, fact that, you know, after orgasm, the cervix actually opens up a little bit. Um, and then of course the sex flush goes away. It takes a little bit of time though. And so the resolution phase can take a while to go from this fully aroused, you know, high blood pressure, fast heart rate, sex flush, vasocongestion to sort of back to normal. So, um, it's, a uh, it's not like a light switch going off. Now for some people, it happens quicker than others. Younger people will go through the resolution phase a little quicker than older people, um, things like that. But on average, it takes a little bit of time. All right, let's go ahead and stop here. And I will wrap up with other models of sexual responding in my last lecture on this chapter.